Hello, Foothills family. Today we've reached 2 Samuel 23. The chapter begins, now these are the last words of David. When a person is able to give last words, they're passing along the message of great importance before their parting. Their life message, what's most important to them. Well, he starts out with what's important about himself. In verse 1, he first identifies himself as the son of Jesse, which is a reminder of where he came from, his humble beginnings. He was not born to a royal family, but to commoners, not in a palace, but on a farm. He was not in a line to be a ruler. He was out in the pasture following sheep in the wilderness. Next, he describes himself as the man who was raised on high, raised by God from shepherd boy to ruler of all of Israel, from one of the lowest positions to the highest. Christian, we are also raised on high. Ephesians 2.6 says, God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We were taken from lowliness, being slaves to sin, and raised to the greatest honor that could be bestowed. Raised to share in his position as adopted children of God, to share in his destiny. Then David describes himself as the anointed of God. He was anointed with oil by Samuel according to God's leading. That he would become ruler of Israel was purely God's choosing, not his own. This was a source of confidence for David in the face of challenges, threats, and obstacles that he faced. If it was God's calling, then no one could take it from him unless God was taking it from him. David knew his calling and embraced it with humility, faith, and courage. It was the work God had prepared in advance for David to walk in with, full, with his full support and power. Ephesians 2.10 says that you are God's workmanship created for good works, which have been prepared in advance for you to walk in. What has God prepared for you to walk in? What has he anointed you to do? This is something God's able to reveal and confirm to those who seek him and seek to know that. Finally, David is the sweet psalmist of Israel. He was a warrior who cut off the head of Goliath, and at the same time, he's a singer and worship songwriter. He loved the Lord as God and being in his presence. In verse 2, David says that the Spirit of the Lord spoke through him and that his word, God's word, was on his tongue. He wants people to know that it was God who was speaking through him. His psalms were inspired by the Holy Spirit. Jesus concurred in Matthew twenty-two forty-three, 43, where referring to one of the psalms, he says David spoke in the Spirit. Jesus embracing the Psalms of David as having the full authority of Scripture. These songs and prayers were from God. If the Bible is God's inspired communication to mankind, what God has spoken to humanity, then the Psalms are a Holy Spirit-inspired response of mankind to God. God speaks and man answers. So the Psalms provide a pattern for how to worship and pray, how to respond to God in tough times or when we've failed a pattern for how to cry out to God um, and be real about things we struggle with, but not without faith. David's reign was filled with drama, issues, and challenges. He's very much a model for those of us acquainted with failure, trials, hardship, or betrayal. When things are going wrong and you don't understand, whatever you're going through, likely there's a psalm for that. The psalms are one of David's great contributions. David's psalms can give strength and give us a response when we otherwise wouldn't know how to respond. Have you utilized the psalms for a pattern of how to have the right heart and response toward God? Maybe it would serve you well to Google search for a psalm that applies to just what you're going through right now. Well, David continues his final words with a form, uh, in the form of a psalm, of course, speaking of the blessings that a righteous ruler bring and the promise that God had made for an everlasting reign, which was understood to be the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the King, the Son of David, who would usher in the reign of God's kingdom on earth. And then he, this contrast, was contrasted with the certain judgment that the worthless will face because of their opposition to God's kingdom. Then he contrasts, or he then contrasts the promise of blessing upon his house with the promise of destruction for these worthless, those whom reject God's kingdom. The second part of the chapter, because this chapter is divided into two parts, is a list and summary of David's mighty men, a group of David's toughest military warriors who accomplished heroic feats and amazing victories. When David was avoiding Saul's wrath, he attracted a group of men who gathered to him to stand with him, 
In 1 Samuel 22, 2, it describes these men as those who are in distress, in debt, and discontented. They were a group of dissidents who banded together with David and grew under his leadership. And it was many of these men who would mature into courageous fighters and show astonishing bravery. Men with considerable military skill, but more importantly, had the blessing of God. Some were born warriors, to be sure, but their true strength was a faith in God, just like their mentor David. Thirty-seven men are listed here who served to protect the king and to fight to protect their nation Israel. There were three men who became distinguished above the others that are listed first here, starting with the greatest of them all, that was Josheb Bashibabib. Okay, I'm not even going to try to do that again. You can read it and see what I'm talking about. He was chief of the captains who killed 800 men in one battle with a spear. Then there was Eleazar who stayed on the battlefield when all the others fled, what looked like certain defeat, and he killed Philistines until his hand was stuck, clenched around his sword. They must have had to pry his fingers off. And then there was Shammah who alone defended a plot of land that had a crop of lentils, and he faced a, an army of Philistines taking a stand in the middle of that plot, single-handedly striking them all down. It says twice in these accounts that the Lord brought about a great victory that day. The strength that these men, uh, of these men was that they aligned themselves with God's anointed. And God's blessing that was upon David spilled over onto them. Much like us as we align ourselves with Christ, the son of David. They were strong because they imitated the faith of David. No matter how skilled a fighter you are, these kind of victories don't happen apart from God's intervention. They trusted God against all odds, and he fought for them and empowered them to do what they could not. David inspired courage and confidence in these mighty men. We can also be inspired to believe God like David and these mighty men did. Do we have this kind of faith? Will we allow our life to be a case study for what God can do when someone believes against the odds? Will we allow God to bring us into situations where that kind of faith is called for so that we can likewise have a testimony of God's miracle power. In verse 13, we find one of the most well-known acts of David's mighty men. It was a daring retrieval of water from a well in Bethlehem. During a time when the Philistine army was seeking to kill King David, he and his men fled to a secure area, a cave, to plan their response. Some of David's men overheard him lamenting that he longed for a drink from one of the wells of his former hometown, which was now occupied and serving as a camp of the enemy army. Well, these men so respected David, they were so loyal to him, that without his knowing, because he wouldn't have approved, in special ops style, they snuck into the Philistine camp and drew water from the well and brought it to David. It speaks to what kind of man and leader that David was, that they would do this. In verse 16, it says that... They brought it to David, and he would not drink it, but poured it out to the Lord and said, Be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Shall I drink the blood of the men who went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore, he would not drink it. Well, this might come off to us through our cultural lenses as disrespectful or ungrateful. However, it, quite the opposite was true. He was saying that this was of such great value that he was not worthy of it. Only God was. If he had drunk the water, it would have meant that he approved of his men risking their lives for his convenience and extravagance. We see the great dedication here of the loyalty of David's men and also David's humility and great respect for them. David poured it out as an offering of worship, and this was a way to graciously reject what they had done while continuing to honor, honor them. It was the perfect way to value their gift without taking personal advantage of it. Let us be the kind of people who model our faith like the mighty men did after a man like David who was careful to maintain a, a focus on God, to give God the glory for all, all that happened in his life, um, to revere him, um, and uh, to put his trust fully in him. What would our life look like if we had a, a heart after God um, like David? What would that look like for us? Um, what area might that change in our own life? God bless you, Foothills family.